um, we get started, I'll just I'll give you guys the opportunity to go down the line, cool. say a couple sentences about yourself. Um, actually, yeah. you guys, uh, Ken, Toby, and Tom, you probably really don't need to say much in the way of introduction. Yeah. You, Tom, I think it's worthwhile for if you're up for it for me to explain a little bit about what the digital defense service is to so everybody in the room is going to know. Yep. So yep. you can maybe take a little bit longer to introduce yourself and your organization. Yep. I agree. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get rolling. So like Monday, we, now, we don't have chairs or tables, so we're going to be standing on stage. Uh, so before we get started, I'm going to give everybody the opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, let's we'll start with Tom, or this Tom. Yeah. Another Tom is at the end of the stage. Separating for na namespace collision. Uh, so I'm Tom Rondo. Uh, so I used to run the GNU Radio Project uh, up until last year. Uh, did that for about six years. Uh, since then, I have been at DARPA, and I'm a DARPA program manager in the Microsystems Technology Office, where I am trying to do a lot of work on software radio and uh, really focus on arrays, so software-defined arrays uh, is kind of the thing we're, we're looking at. Um, I'm going to say a lot more later, I'm sure, so that's, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you, Tom. Toby? I'm Toby Flynn. I'm from Oak Ridge National Labs. I'm a is your mic on? Oh, it was on. Switch. I'm from Oak Ridge National Labs. Oh, yeah, that okay. uh, I'm a senior researcher there. I'm in the cybersecurity and I've division or group, and I've been uh, working in software electron radio for the last nine years. Thank you, Ken. Hello, uh, and it does work. So my name is Ken Baker. I am currently with the National Telecommunications and Information Association, specifically their uh, ITS, which is the research labs. We're doing stuff with software-defined radios for propagation measurements as well as uh, spectrum monitoring and applications like that. All right, and Tom? Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Bregney. Um, I am uh, with a group called the uh, Defense Digital Service. Uh, we are a group that basically is a swamp team of nerds for the DOD. And um, we actually came across this community originally as uh, part of our open source efforts. And then we actually picked up a project that was very GNU radio heavy, which uh, was just uh, the best of both worlds. So that's why we're here. OK, fantastic. Uh, so we actually got a lot of good questions in the audience. I have, a, I, there, I have a mix of them on my cell phone and in cards. Uh, so I'll be going back and forth as we go. Uh, so just to get things rolling with kind of a, a, a higher level topic, uh, starting actually, I think it'd be good to get an answer from each of you. Uh, for the most part, I think everybody here could tell you uh, the benefits of open source to them um, you know, and why, why it makes sense for them. But uh, if you could tell us what problem, or so each of you are advocates for open source in some way from within the federal government. What problem are you trying to solve by trying to, to advocate for open source more within the federal government or use it more or get people you're working with to use it more? Uh, what, why the change? Yeah, so, so for me uh, at the DOD, uh, I, I look at it as a force multiplier. Uh, we. We have so many problems that we're facing. Uh, you know, the next generation of uh, our battle space really is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's going to be a, such a huge part of of what we're facing and what we have to, to to contend with. And so, the number of problems that exist there, the number of opportunities for both success and failure, is so large that we cannot continue to do the long-term procurement cycles that we do to solve one problem. We have to be able to have common frameworks, common platforms where we can quickly solve many problems. We can adapt to those problems. Uh, and to do that, we need a trained workforce. We need uh, competent uh, technology and technologists to work that, uh, those problems. Uh, and so when you're, when you're building on top of the, the wide knowledge base that has gone into open source software, uh, Linux, uh, the graphics libraries, the signal processing libraries, GNU Radio, all those things are, uh, they're now tools in our belt where we can then just launch new ideas very quickly. Uh, and so I think that, that from a, from when we have a smaller workforce uh, in the DOD than, than other places, 
uh, that are focused on these problems, we need to have that as our platform and our base to launch ourselves off of quickly. Okay. Toby, what about your perspective as a, as a research scientist and engineer? So, for Ferrara and L, we're a large multidisciplinary research center. And we have lots of various individuals there at the lab who are doing research in everything you can think of. Open source for them and for the lab and for us helps us to, I'm trying to get the word, um, we can leverage what we need to, okay. <laughs> Leveraging all the open source allows the researchers to get the cutting edge science they need out. And it also gets us away from a vendor lock-in. As a research lab, we're always buying extremely expensive tools. And we need things that are not normal. They're always close to something. They're not standard. And when you go back to a vendor and say, yes, I need 90% of your thing and I need you to change 10%, it becomes very expensive. Also, we have a lot of visitors that come in, a lot of visiting scientists and engineers that come through the lab. Using open source, leveraging the people who are coming through allows them to already have the tools and the knowledge that they need to come in, use the facilities, and leave with productive science being done. Yeah, I'll co-sign on the vendor lock-in problem. <laughs> I think we're going to, and we'll circle back around to that a little bit later on. Uh, I think one of the questions we, that I'd like to discuss is, uh, how, why, why do you expect people to do business with you if you're asking for IP? Uh, so actually, Ken, I, I'm interested to hear your response here. Um, you're kind of a standout in that you're actually with an organization that uh, is uh, responsible for policy. That's true. Uh, NTI is one of the two spectrum regulators in the, in the country. But before I answer your question, Bill, I, I mean Ben. <laughs> I, I want... <laughs> I want to uh, push back a little bit. You said something about uh, why the change. And, and I, I kind of push back on that a little bit. We, we, NTI has been sharing code and sharing things out on the internet for a long time. In fact, uh, ITS was originally connected to ARPANET back in the 70s and, and pumping out uh, Fortran code for uh, propagation models. But back to your question, which is what what problem are we trying to solve and how does it help us? Perhaps that's a restatement of your question. Um, there's probably two things, um, but one, I guess I'll focus on the, the one, is we are in the middle of trying to develop sensing networks, spectrum sensing networks, and there's a lot of the United States and very little money to do this sort of thing. Um, at the end of this month, we will put out some code on open source for a spectrum sensor, we're hoping to get people's input for how to make that sensor better, and we're getting people to adopt that sensor to, uh, you know, for whatever purpose they want. And we have learned that getting the input from a lot of people on some of these, on the networking parts of it and all these other things, uh, just helps us make a better product. Uh, SIGMF, which I want to say many times if I can, just to, so people start to think about it, is, is an example of that. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that a lot of people can use and, and it has broad applications. Uh, we're going to adopt it and, and it, it helps move everybody forward, I think. All right, and Tom at the end. I don't want to necessarily rehash all the reasons that I fully agree with. Um, <laughs> But uh, one of the, I, I do want to bring in maybe a little, slightly different perspective. Uh, so, at, so DDS exists to bring best practices from private sector and, to DOD. That's its, that's its charter, that's its mission. Um, and then I have the fortunate circumstance to also be a Marine. So my mission is to usually go out and break things or people <laughs> or something like that. And, or sometimes to protect people that need that. And right now, to a large extent, um, we live in an arms race. So what matters right now is speed. And open source lets me do things faster. Lets me iterate, lets me develop, lets me put a capability forward. Yes, I can take $15 million and do this over the course of two years. I don't have that much time because people are either getting hurt now or they need a capability today. Uh, so for me, it represents the ability to get something done as fast as possible. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to start the next question off coming back around to this Tom, DARPA Tom, uh, <laughs> representing uh, an agency that funds lots of programs. Uh, 
how can the how can federal government do a better job of encouraging open source within its projects and programs? Yeah, that's a really good question because this, this does will speak to that that what well, we talked about vendor lock in, and then you talked about uh, kind of the, the business model uh, and, and commercialization models. So how do we engage that conversation with our, uh, as we call them, our performers, uh, the people that propose to us when we, we announce a big program, uh, this is an intention that DARPA is going to go after some science and technology, and then people propose to us. Uh, and within that cycle, there's a real opportunity for us to, to lay our, our, our mark in the ground that says this is important to us. I've, I've explained why I think uh, open source is important to the DOD. Uh, so then we have to then uh, you know, engage that with, uh, with the people that propose to us. Um, and so we, we will do that during contracting and during the, in, the engagement of getting them on contract uh, and, and trying to have that conversation about where it makes sense to be open source and when it stops making sense to be open source uh, as people come to us with that. Uh, I will say, uh, you know, we, we put out a BAA, our broad agency announcement, uh, yesterday for a few programs, and the language in that that for my program is a bias towards open source, and to explain to me why you're not going to open source your code for this program. Uh, so the selection bias is on open sourcing. Uh, this this, and, and you have to have a very good reason not to in that case, and we'll engage that conversation. There's that stack from you know from kind of the operating system Linux on up of all these open source tools that we build, and the success of the Intel uh, is, is largely been because we have all those tools. We have the compilers and the debuggers and the performance tools and all that to, to work with it and build up these communities that we can do all this stuff here with. But eventually you are going to build your radio application. That's your secret special sauce that does something really cool, and you're gonna work with that in your own, your own space. Uh, so now you're, you're protecting certain amounts of your IP. So there is a conversation about where along that stack do you then make your special mark uh, where everything else below there. And for every application and every organization, I think that line is different. It needs to be a conversation. So start with open source by default and then work with the, the, the companies to figure out what their, uh, where their line is uh, from there. Okay, so you're talking about how you representing DARPA MTO are going to trying to encourage your performers uh, by basically not giving them money. Uh, but so I'm kind of, I want to actually go back to Captain Tom from a slightly different angle. So, uh, what about actually upstreaming from within the government? Why isn't the government, why aren't government employees upstreaming all the work that they do? And what what can be done differently there to improve that? Uh, the, the biggest hindrance on that is one of culture or just people not knowing. Um, they, you know, pe people can. It's just either not, they're not encouraged, it's sometimes explicitly forbidden by local policies, or just the opportunity isn't there. Um, I think that fixing that comes down to a matter of the value of participating in a community, uh, being seen and being uh, seen as something that has something that can bring in a, a lot of value. There is, Oftentimes, they're going to. There's a lot of hindrances or things that get step that get put in the way, and those are going to be because of all this, the the fears that we always hear about this in terms of either uh, security, in terms of well, we can't trust this, we don't have support, we don't know what this is going to be. It's that distrust of open source, and uh, the only way to really fix that is is just over time to show that this is probably the only way we're ever gonna be able to keep up and also to remain relevant. If all the interesting ideas and all the interesting projects and all the interesting contributions are always from outside of government, you can never, the government becomes this silo where it can't contribute and participate in a community, then eventually people leave. You have a, a brain drain out of government and then it doesn't really matter, you're no longer a player. Um, you start losing that competence and, the, and those capabilities. Um, so I think um, one of the big reasons to participate in a community and not just either you know, consume from it but to give back as well is that then you, could, then you get to benefit from being that active member, uh, not just either a passive participant or just not ignoring it. And if I can jump on there real fast to connect our two answers, that the idea that I had of open source by default, that is actually policy language coming out of both the White House and the DOD. Mm -hmm. They both have policy memos about doing more open source work. 
Uh, and one of the things that I think Ben, maybe you were, you were kind of alluding to in your question is, uh, is the contributing back, right? And, and those, that was what I thought was very smart about the White House policy was, don't just open source stuff by putting it on GitHub or Bitbucket and then, and then just declaring success. It's find the communities that are doing the same thing that you're doing, open sourcing it by working with those communities and contributing that code back. And one thing that, you know, having run this, this program, the people that got the most out of it were the people that gave us the most. So there was a, uh, there's mutual selfishness there, uh, but it also does work for the greater good that you, you contribute code back, we're gonna pay more attention to you. Uh, and I think we don't do that as, uh, in government as well as we should. But culture is a good, good excuse, but I think we're, we have a vision that, that we're trying to push through, these, uh, through our discussions with folks and through the policies that exist. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the policy because that is, that is a big driver, but I, I also wanna say that the government's really big. Um, these guys are a one end of things. We're, NTI is sort of in a, more in a research space more than, um, than a, a military space. We have a culture of sharing. It's growing though. So it's not, it, it is a, a change in, in getting people using some of the tools like GitHub and some of, the, some of the code out there. And that gets back to the culture thing. People, it's, it's not, it, it's just new. I, I'm sorry, we've all been sort of swimming in open source for a while, but it's just new and it takes a while for these things to really soak into a large organization like, like the government. Okay, so, um uh, actually, let's expand upon that even maybe a little bit more. Uh, right now, we're talking about contributions and upstreaming. What about just money? Uh, you know, why? Like, why? Why is All the Good the Radio money. Foundation not getting checks from government agencies to support the project? Aren't, aren't you? No. <laughs> Uh, I think we, we already heard this morning uh, somebody was, was thankful for getting paid to, uh, to work on Guinea Radio. I think there's a lot of people who are contributors to Guinea Radio who, who are getting paid through, through various programs and projects that, that do come from government funding. Um, I will, uh, there's, there's a big Hume Center over there that, that, has, that has continued to engage with, uh, with Guinea Radio. Uh, so I think, I think that does exist, but, but yeah, we're not, we're not writing a check to the Guinea Radio Foundation just yet. Um, and that's uh, is that something that we that you think should exist? Is that is that a direction that makes sense? Is direct funding of open source projects by federal government? So I'll tell a story about when uh, DARPA funded FreeBSD. Okay. Uh, so so DARPA directly put in money to FreeBSD. Uh, that was a friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Smith, uh, who I worked with at UPenn, and who's now back at DARPA. Uh, and he, he funded it for a while, and a Canadian got really upset that the Department of Defense and DARPA, big top secret agency and scary DARPA, mind control and goats and, sh and uh, <laughs> Mo Boons, uh, you know, Agent Orange and all that, DARPA, was funding uh, this project. So obviously we're putting secret code in there and we're gonna control all of your sockets. Uh, that was, that blew up. I don't know if you, if you guys remember this, but that blew up. Uh, and people are still trying to find the, the, the dark magic that we put into uh, FreeBSD uh, TCP stack. Uh, so Jonathan said, okay, I take my money away. You don't get it anymore. And that really, that helped launch a, 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 a rift between those two, uh, between communities and direct community funding. Uh, so, and so from DARPA's perspective, let me, so that's an anecdote, let me roll back to DARPA's funding model, which is we fund programs, and so we, it has to have a relevance to the programs that we are funding. We, we do use GNU Radio in DARPA programs all the time, uh, but it's to the performers who are using it to build their thing, and it just happens to use you. Why, you know, that disconnect is yeah. something that, that has to be bridged. And I think, I think to some degree that's specific to funding agencies, uh, but I, I could, I mean, if somebody was up here from NASA, for example, I, you know, I would ask the same question. Um, NASA uses GNU Radio, why isn't NASA you know, giving money to GNU Radio? Or, or, or NASA uses Clang, or whatever, you know, any other open source project. Um, but okay, so let's actually move on a second. Toby, I wanna, I wanna go back to something you said when you introduced yourself. You said that you like using GNU Radio from the National Laboratory because you often need products from somebody uh, and it does 90% of what you want, but then what you said in different words is then you like to basically break it to make it do something else. Uh, and in order to do that, you need access to the source code, to the right. designs, that sort of thing. Um, so, what you're asking for is for somebody to sell their product to you and give enough 
it either give you all the design or enough of the design for you to not only understand how it works, but change it. Um, isn't that asking a lot? You're, you're asking for somebody's IP, right? Sometimes, but for a lot of what we do as a research lab, we actually pay for the development of the hardware. And when we're for hardware signs, there's lots of custom hardware design for us. But you still end up with people that they'll custom design the hardware to your spec, and then you messed up and didn't put the right thing in, and now you have a bug in the code, and you can't fix some firmware bug in your custom designed hardware. And you spent millions getting the hardware custom built. Or, on the other thing is, for example, if you go to MathWorks and acquire their version of MathWorks, Mat, you know, name the MATLAB thing, <laughs> pick it. Uh, you get some version of the LTT stat of, of a stack, it works. You need to do research. You need it to be a little different than the standard. You can't change it to make it be different. Mm -hmm. So what you run into is you could change 95% of it, the 2% you need to change, you can't. Now you have to re-engineer that part. <coughs> it's not that we can't do it and that we do it, but if you start up knowing that you're going to be different than the standard, then you look for things that you can be different than. Okay. And you know, we're willing to pay for access to information. Okay, so that's the custom design angle. Like, go, yeah. I, but I like to say, but to, to, you know, to fix that bug, it's another contract. And, and, yeah. and if you've ever tried to get a government contract, anybody here, you know, it takes, takes a little bit of time. Okay, so actually I'd like to jump down to, to Captain Tom then. Uh, my impression that is the products that you, that you guys are using your team are mostly COTS, right? You're like your group, uh, you're not issuing contracts for custom development. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, sometimes we do. Uh, oh, okay. It just depends on whatever's uh, frankly, the best way to get the job done. Um, so we've done where we uh, contract out. We've done situations where we develop something in-house. In sometimes the right answer for a problem is sometimes just a policy change. So whatever is the right way to solve whatever problem we're addressing. Okay. So, well, so I like to to maybe uh, step step take that and step a little bit uh, in a different direction. This one's both for Ken and Tom, uh, and talk about policy specifically. Um, so I'm going to read this one just word for word. Uh -oh. There's currently no certification process for open source SDR frameworks. As the federal government adopts said frameworks, do you envision a need for a process of standard or pro for a process or standard used to evaluate how compliant a specific implementation may be? This applies to radios meant for both private citizens as well as radios meant for mil for military use or government use. So are we are we talking about certifying SDRs? The cells, or after we built something with the SDR. Uh, how about either? Like, if somebody is is the fact the fact that there's no such thing as a certification process for a good radio flow graph. How does that how does that impact us? Is that is that something that NTI NTIA would want to see? Is that would that even make sense? I I don't think now I have to speak for myself, I, you know, uh, which I have been this whole time. But I, I, don't, I don't think it makes sense for <laughs> I think for ditto, for the, ditto for the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, let's get that out clear. But uh, I, I don't think it makes sense. I, it, and it depends a little bit on the application and, and how things are, you know. So it's a little bit for me to take this scenario out of context. But, you know, this struggle of regulating SDRs has been going on for a while at least with the FCC. I mean, they, and it, there are some people I think get really scared that citizens can broadcast. And so there are rules out there. You're not supposed to be in certain bands. You're not supposed to be at certain power levels. I mean, so far, I mean, I know there's exceptions and people violate all this stuff. So what are you going to regulate? I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm a little, I'm struggling with this. But then you tar start talking about putting together a system like some of the SAS uh, systems for monitoring LTE from for spectrum sharing in a CBRS band, that's what it's called, the uh, mm -hmm. 3.5 gigahertz band. Um, that whole, somebody likes it, and somebody knows what it is. <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> we need to certify that patent, no. Um, <laughs> but no, the, that whole system needs to be certified and will be certified, and, and I'm not sure we're gonna care what it's built out of as long as it's, functioning correctly. So there are people working on that. I'm not one of them, but. 
Okay, Tom, do you have a, so you, when you introduced yourself, you mentioned that you're basically a SWAT team of nerds at the Pentagon and you guys drop in and fix problems that need, urgent, that need to be urgently solved. Sounds kind of like you're ignoring policy when you do that about... So one of the uh, superpowers we have is to take a look at what the policy is and take a look at it with a fresh pair of eyes and if it needs to be changed or amended or something has to be just solved and that policy is just standing in the way, um, then we can waive things. Um, that is something that is, it's precious, so you gotta make sure you don't abuse it, um, but it's something that we can do at times. Um, I do wanna respond a bit to the, the certification question mm -hmm. as well. Um, I, I understand the motivation behind something like that and you know, why someone can easily see that that is a way to solve the problem. Um, my fear is though that the solution that you end up with is, is gonna become more damaging than the problem you mm -hmm. already face. Um, you know, a simple question would be, all right, we need to do certifications. Well, who is going to certify it? Who, who in government is going to have the expertise that is above and beyond those people already who are developing these things? And so the question is going to be, how is this going to actually help us catch up with the private sector, the rest of the world, to maintain relevance if all we're doing is putting more hurdles in front of our developers, more than there already are? That's my concern. So if I can respond to, to, to Ken, I, I'll take actually a, uh, probably a weird position uh, coming from me. So having run GNU Radio, uh, where we got to hack the spectrum, and I spent a lot of time apologizing to the head of the FCC's Office of Engineering Technology. Right. And luckily, Julie is a great guy, very smart, and he would laugh it off, and he'd be like, no, you guys are doing really good work. But when I look at what we do now like from the DOD perspective, you know, the technology that we're building is going into our platforms, it's going into our, our, uh, our jets, our fighter pilots are depending on this. In the open source software world, it's release early and release often and kind of let you guys be our beta testers. I really don't like the idea of my fighter pilot friends being beta testers of our software. Now, that translates into a very ro rigorous and overly rigorous VNV and test and evaluation uh, track which we're trying to fight against, but I am sympathetic to it because you know these are lives on the line. Well, I, I guess I'm a little bit of student of history, not a great student perhaps, but I, I would offer that we would not have won World War II if we'd have followed all the V and V rules required before deploying radar <laughs> and everything else, which is what I think my friend Tom on this side, my new friend, <laughs> was saying that you've got to use some common sense. And it's like, well, we need to solve this problem. We'll common sense in the government? It's a big ask, isn't it? Well. <laughs> No. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. It was too easy. The setup was too easy. Well, Bill. <laughs> that one's never going to die, you, is it? It's never going to die. Again. Thank you, Tom. I mean, Ted. Yeah, Ted, Doing Bill. Um, no, yeah, common sense. I, you know, now we're in the large organizations. It, it comes down to individuals and lots of things like that about how these decisions can and should be made, and uh, that's another subject, perhaps. Well, something we've engaged on is making sure that the people who can make those decisions, the people who have the right sort of domain knowledge and expertise, are there to make the decision. We don't always have to call out to someone else and hope and trust. It's we, they're already in government. They're already in these organizations, or we know how to find them when we have a problem or a question about policy or a question about a particular use case, well, we know, oh, well, the expert is already here. We already trust this person because they're already working for us. They can help us solve whatever the problem is. Um, so I guess figuring out ways to keep those people you know, inside is a hard problem. Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, Actually, what I would like to do is I want to get, uh, I have a question from, from Tim O'Shea, and I'd like for him to ask it, but I can't, uh, it's all mangled on my phone, and I can't read it anymore. Somebody get mic to Tim, that'd be great. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to, uh, kind of taking the certification and the government mandated architecture question for, oh, oh wait, we have all the mics, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> all right, here, I got it. No, I guess, I'm just curious, so I know there was a lot of gut reaction in the beginning against uh, vendor lock-in, which obviously comes with its problems for government, 
and for maintenance and adaptation and everything. I guess I'm curious if you guys could address the trade-off between that versus government solutions, which can also come with similar stovepipe issues and similar organizational uh, territorial battles and things. And I think that you know both of those have a lot of problems. And I guess I'm just curious how you see those two, uh, you know, how you see that trade-off and open source helping or hindering either side of it. Anybody want to start, Tom? Yeah. So uh, we we discussed this uh, even uh, earlier this morning. Was so there's that the approach of how do we in government participate in open source, and that's definitely a problem that needs to be addressed and fixed. But also internal to government, so we'll call this you know limited distribution or internal to the organization. It's a whole other ecosystem. It's a whole other I'll call it a whole other marketplace. A whole other way that you have enforcement and memorandum of understanding and there's no contracts, you don't really sue, one department doesn't necessarily sue another, it's, the relationships are different. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the concepts the open source community has uh, does apply. You can kind of take those, so the more we kind of participate and learn these norms of behavior in the open source world, we can now start reusing those internally. So I start sharing with another agency, that agency now instead of turning around and taking that and siloing it away because they're concerned about you know, budget or you know, prestige or getting the credit, now actually gives back and now there's a community. This one might not be open source, but it'll be at least a community that's internal to government. And that kind of helps that kind of internal sharing back and forth. And that also you know, helps you identify those times when something should be then open to the public. So I think you can, have solve, you can solve both of those problems using many of the same mechanisms. So, uh, Toby, I'm kind of interested in your take on this because uh, you and your team are actually actively building systems. You specifically said that you like to avoid vendor lock-in. How, how, how do you deal with that versus the organizational and program stovepipe of, of moving things around? Most of what we're building is smaller systems and not as large. Now, for the lab, they build a lot of test stuff. And there, since we are a... Office of Science research facility. We actually, and they have been doing better at the lab over the last five years of instilling an open source type mentality throughout the lab on sharing um, everything. And a lot of the, a lot of publications now coming out of the DOE Office of Science labs require that source code be available, all the data be posted in available and shared areas. So if it is all possible, it is all shared now and it's put out on various websites so that other people can go find it and get it. For the most part, the, within the DOE, we do a good job of sharing with ourselves. Now, I don't know when we cross from DOE to... The Department of the Commerce. Commerce. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, Toby and I now talk. We can... We can <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This has been helpful. Um, there, are, there are issues. There are still issues with stovepiping. As a personal advocate, I think the open source within government, open source in general, supporting open source actually is the <coughs> solution to the problems that we have in lots of cases. You have people who've done it the old way and they need to learn the new way. And there's an education and a policy issue. Getting new lawyers helps. Yeah. So fresh lawyers, get rid of the old ones. Gets back to, <laughs> gets back to culture. One of the things I, I, I keep thinking about as we have this discussion, vendor lock-in is not a government-only problem. It's a, it's a problem in industry as well. In other words, I, I don't think there's anything unique about the government being, you know, wanting to avoid uh, uh, vendor lock-in. Uh, I think we all want to encourage that because we all are taxpayers. Uh, but the same thing happens in industry. The telephone industry suffered from this for years, and I don't want to get through there. but. It, it's, it's everywhere, and open source sort of deals with this in, in all kinds of levels, not just for the, for the government, but Tom has to say something. <laughs> I always do. Uh, yeah, no, so I, I completely agree from the side of like how, it, how we do better in the government. I agree with everything we, you know, that was said there. Uh, from Tom, the, if we keep agreeing, there won't I be know, a panel. We need I to, come on. I tried <laughs> to disagree with you, and then you went running to, uh, to Captain Tom over there, so. Uh, <laughs> So technically, we're academic brothers. We had the same advisor, so we go <laughs> weird. We'll go way back. Um, no, so I'm thinking about it from the terms of uh, from that that kind of commercial perspective, uh, and why would they work with us when we're trying to to get new solutions? 
I just I see the world that we're, we have for technology is just being so vast and the number of problems to solve is so huge that it, it's, we can't just be doing these one-off solutions anymore and, and those big, big projects. Uh, so, but, but then the, the example, the metaphor that I have is, right, think of, think of a toilet gasket. And if you're gonna build a toilet gasket for a standardized toilet, you can build a billion of those a year and sell them for one cent and you're gonna make a profit. If you're gonna build a gasket for the International Space Station, you're gonna build two of them a year and you're gonna sell each one of those for $10 billion and you're gonna make a profit. If you're anywhere in between where you don't have that market space or that cost effectiveness, what, is, what, what, what fills that in? And that's, that's, the, that's the hope of additive manufacturing, right? That's what we would call the long tail of problem spaces to, to be solved. Those, any one of those isn't worth going after in one-offs, but in aggregate, it is worth it. There is a large area under that curve where all those solutions can exist. So there are so many problems that we can keep putting money on, that it, that, but we can change it from the mentality of, let's solve this one big problem and we've solved everything. Uh, we, we, we're not gonna get there. And I think that that's where a lot of the open source, that's where software radio plays in, and that's where a lot of the open source mo mentality of, we have to have those, those small tweaks here and there to solve this. Um, the other thing that I wanna say is, uh, as far as, as uh, folks working with us and continuing to work with us, is you're now the expert. You know, uh, people kept coming to, to myself and Jonathan Corgan and others who are, the, the folks that have been in, the, in GRCon or have, or have worked with GNU Radio for, for a decade or more, we were the people that people kept coming to when they needed to solve a problem in GNU Radio. We could just say, well, it's open source, solve it yourself. But we, were the, we built expertise around that. So even though it was open source, we were still, there was a value there for us to be able to do something useful with it that nobody else could do. The, but then if we gave them a slightly wrong uh, fix or there was a, a, an optimization, you could go and tune that parameter, right? So there's different levels of engagement and there's still huge opportunities for, uh, for commercial uh, and industry to, to play and, and be successful. Okay, uh, so I want, to, so talking a little bit about the culture, it, well, all four of you have talked a little bit about the culture problem uh, and how you think open source is, might be the solution to that and bringing the open source culture into the federal government. So one of our questions actually, specifically, is about uh, how disparate different uh, federal government groups are, even internally, in their approach to open source projects. Um, so I'll, I'll read this one word for word too. The federal government doesn't seem very consolidated in its approach to open source, specifically GNU Radio. Why isn't FedGov more organized and coordinated about collaborating with communities? Why is everybody in here that's part of the federal government? Oh, oh, can I take this one? It's a big organization with a lot of different people <laughs> and a lot of different missions. I, you're asking a lot. <laughs> yeah. Is there a way to make that? Is there a way to make that better? Is there a way to do it differently? That's a very good question. I wish I had the answer to that. I'd run for office or something. But, but I, I, Tom, or Captain Tom? I, uh, I have no idea what the state of Coliseum is right now. Uh, <laughs> and and Paul, Paul, literally sits, Paul literally sits right next door to me. Paul doesn't know what the Hackfest is about, and I sit right next door to him. Uh, even within our own office, we run our own programs, and, and there is a disconnect. But there, and there, and we are so busy, and we are so focused on our on our work. And I and DARPA, we do like to think that we're different than the rest of the government, but it really does come down to there is so much work that we're trying to accomplish, and we don't have enough uh, people there to then try to scale that out and 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 make that happen. Uh, as Ken said, we're asking a lot. So you're saying the problem is intractable. Uh, <laughs> over what amount of time? <laughs> I think that answers the question. She goes to infinity. <laughs> well, I, no, I, seriously, I kind of cultures to... change slowly, and you know, where do you want to measure it? I would actually give a, a, a similar caution as I did before: is do we really want a coordinated uh, policy? Do we really want a one-stop solution for all of this massive you know, organization that applies to research, to operational, to you know, the testing? Research to policy, I mean, the one, one single unified coordinated uh, thing is, is probably not the, not the answer, and if it was, we probably wouldn't get it right the first time anyway. Yeah, but then we're just duplicating effort, and that's a waste of the taxpayer dollars. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, but it's actually very hopeful. It, it, yeah. it gives me, it brings me hope to see that there are various organizations who are trying to attack this problem in a few different ways because that's how we explore the problem space, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's. And it's yeah, it might seem wasteful, but it's the only way to figure out what the best approach is, is to try out a few different things and see what works. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears for a second. Um, we have a couple questions from other federal government employees that are in the audience. Uh, I'd like to go through a couple of these. How can I show my management hard numbers on how open sourcing benefits us? So not using open source code, but open sourcing. For example, open, open sourcing resulted in a savings of X, X, X dollars? That's a great question. It really is. Um, I've been asking that of the maker movement. Uh, what's, you know, longitudinal studies about how the maker movements have impacted local businesses, and nobody is doing that kind of work. Um, I don't, um, I'm going to put that out there because I actually, that's, you know, I'm injecting my own. I want a solution for that. Um, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start thinking about that while hopefully other people have come up with a solution. Toby, can you solve the problem on the spot? <laughs> it is hard to quantify in a dollar sense for them for open sourcing. Uh, I would offer on a case I mean, by you, case basis. You on might a case be able by case, it. you may be able to have people who have you know, um, cases where it has worked for them. We have lots of people who have contributed to various open source projects at the lab. Um, the Fortran uh, thing for or the the Swig. Fortran and SWIG was put in from ORNL. One of the nice things about it is now it's mainstream, it's upstreamed. So it is maintained for them and there's a cost savings coming back to them as SWIG gets modified. They're still helping maintain it, but at least it's gonna be tested and it's shared with other people within the lab. And I think that's part of it is, or within DOE, and you gotta look at it as a higher, the cost savings has to somehow be calculated for the government as a whole. And it's a hard thing to do for the one person to say, I'm saving money out of my budget. They may not save much money out of their budget unless they're getting other people to contribute back in, but the government as a whole will save money because they're now sharing the code. Like what the other Tom down here was discussing earlier, it's shared, but it's shared because of the community. It's not the internal sharing, but it's still shared within the government and everyone else. But is any, I mean, would any government agency care about saving some other agency money? Like, so, to, so to, to, Captain, to Captain Tom, so this is, this is part of what you do, right, is you convince people, you, you try to encourage people to, to open source stuff. So is this yes. the wrong strategy? Is the dollar strategy the wrong one? What is, what is your pitch? Uh, I don't have an aggregate answer to that one to, to figure out, you know, here's the studies I can point to. Uh, what I can point to, though, is specifically how, how this has benefited the projects I've been involved in. So if we are working on a project and we're coming across an issue or a bug or something I, I want to fix, all right, if I upstream this and I'm showing that I'm trying to give back to the community, when I have a problem that might be peculiar to my application, I am much more likely to get assistance back from the open community. And that shaves time and development off, you know, off of actually getting something out the door. So that sense, I can actually point to, oh, this saved us this many weeks, the fact that I can actually go call up someone or contact someone in the open source community, and they answered that call not because they answer everyone's call, but because you showed that you cared about the community and you gave back to it. Yeah. Um, it's an investment that sometimes reaps great rewards. And that's where I was headed a little bit when I said, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, I, I mean, if you, if, like, it just saved time getting to, to the end goal. So you could measure that in dollars if you want to. Um, anyway. One so, thing I will say on that is, is I've seen just better technology come out with the programs that are based on open source code, especially like watching the GNU radio space happen. I think we've actually been able to build better solutions, and so for the same amount of money, we've just actually gotten better science technology out of it. Okay, uh, so I actually wanna, this is kind of a very specific question. It's also from a federal government employee, uh, but I think it's an important one because I think a lot of people struggle with it. Uh, in my experience as a government, I'm going to throw this to Captain Tom. In my experience <laughs> as a government employee, open sourcing code developed on a government-funded contract takes a very long time. Most of the problem is the lawyers. Is it even po is it even possible to overcome that? It is. Um, it, at in the beginning, and we'll still say this is still a growing uh, consensus that we're trying to bring to government. Mm -hmm. uh, it is hard because you have to convince every single lawyer every time you bring it up. 
every policy person or every person between you and that approval to get something open sourced or to use open source. Uh, you have to kind of go through the same old arguments, the same rehash, the same uh, reposts to everything all the time. And eventually, the hope is, of course, that changes, maybe with arguments about how this helps speed things up or it's cost savings or gives you better science and technology. Um, the, what I worry about is oftentimes people do this and they, and they, they struggle and they fight and they, they do this for you know, month after month, year after year, and sometimes you see kind of the, it, they're, they're fighting in such a big organization and such an amount of momentum that you know, people start kind of saying, well, it, it's, it's too hard, it's not gonna work, or as soon as the lawyers get involved, well, okay, it might not ever happen. Um, only thing I could recommend is you know, keep pushing for that. Um, or push in a different way, find another way to achieve what you're trying to do. Um, if you're in government and you want to open source something, you have, you're starting to get a lot of the tools you need to make that possible. If you have issues with like licensing, if you have issues with getting it through um, you know, the lawyers, we now have the amendments to the uh, uh, Defense Authorization Act, so that's some of that's gonna start mandating the use of open source and mandating that's, that uh, acquisitions use uh, open source software. And so I think we're trying to build those tools to, so that you can do it on your own. Um, and so if there are like, specific issues, I think that, uh, actually like, this is one of the things that we do. If you have a specific thing that you are just pushing really hard to get out because you know that's the right thing to do, uh, bring it up to us because one of the things we do is we go out and we find those specific problems that have a large amount of impact and we help push it out the door and we take that fight. Um, so just just to be clear, by, by bring it up to us, you're you're saying people should go to you, go yeah, to the Defense have, Digital Service. Yeah, if you are in government and there's something specific that you just want to push out as open source, come to me after this and we'll see if, what we can do. Yeah, round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you threw yourself under the bus, but that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so um, you had actually, this is, this is, this is an interesting one. So you actually had just mentioned uh, change, I, I can't remember, the uh, uh, Defense Authorization Act changes to policy mm -hmm. about um, mandating the use of open source, right? We saw the, um, the memo written for DOD in 2009 um, about uh, clarifying what open source is and when you should use it. We saw uh, the Obama administration uh, in mid-2016 mid uh, issue the federal source code policy where 20% of, of taxpayer-funded projects um, must be open sourced. Uh, so those are all generic to open source. We have one here. Uh, so this says, Red Hawk and the tactical open architecture are currently being written into federal contracts as an implementation requirement. Are you aware of or do you envision a similar requirement for other SDR frameworks more importantly, is that something that should exist? Should it, does it make sense for the federal government to mandate the use of open source or mandate the use of GNU Radio or any other framework? Anyone? All right, so um, from our perspective, uh, again, that DARPA role, uh, we wouldn't, uh, we would, you know, we release uh, the broad agency announcements and it is to, it's to help you bring the best ideas to us and help us vet those best ideas. So we, we try not to mandate too much as far as something like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll push on ideas that we think are really good ideas and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll encourage things, but we will let the community uh, come to us uh, to propose those. I will however say that there are current DARPA programs and there will be future ones that are using GNU Radio in particular, and if those are successful and if, those, if that technology, which looks like it's going to be successful because of GNU Radio, transition into, into military uh, needs, that will probably push that into the requirements documents that that is a, a thing is, to happen. Is that something that we, that we should want? I mean, do we, should we want policy mandating the GNU Radio was deployed into things? Do you think that makes, from your perspective and your history with the project, is that something that you think would be good for us? Yes. Any disagreement? <laughs> For the same reason I said last time, uh, I don't think having that one-stop solution uh, is necessarily the right way to go, so I'd actually say no. I don't, I don't think we should mandate uh, things like that. Now, should it be possible to mandate it uh, if there's a specific project that you have where you're operating in an ecosystem where that is the right answer, answer then sure. 
but I don't want to then lock out another situation where something different should be mandated. So that's a project to project specific thing. And I agree. When I, yeah, I would, the blanket, yes. Uh, Tom, I, you just, like, we had the first I know, I know, but just, I know. No, 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 you can't just jump on. Like, no, no, I changed no, no, my no, mind. No, I agree, no, no, I agree. No, no, yes, no yes. all right, we're done. Yeah. So we only have a few minutes left. Uh, what I'd like to do is go back down the line. Um, you did well. So how can we as a community be better, or be better with, uh, with uh, federal government organizations, both them understanding and using open source and contributing back to us, uh, what, what can we be doing differently? What can we be doing better? Is there some kind of outreach that we should be doing? I mean, we don't have lobbyists, we don't have lawyers, uh, right? we're mostly a volunteer community. Uh, what, what is it that we could be doing to make this problem, or make this problem less painful? I think from my perspective, it's to know that we're there and that we are listening and that we are willing to engage and, and hear from you. Uh, and, and to pull those, you know, make sure that you come to our doors and say, like, this is, this is a thing that's important to us. Uh, and we do pay attention. We do listen to those, uh, the, those ideas. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's what, what I'm going to Toby? I think the biggest thing we've, that we have to do is internal education of other people within facilities. So by internal education, just to be clear, you're talking about internal to the federal government? Yes. So advocating more to the managers who have been around longer and don't see the value in open source, that it is a value. And you know, showing examples of where open source has saved them money does come back into play, or where it has allowed problems to be solved that wouldn't be solved without it. Okay, so I mean, that's, I would say that's something that we are pretty bad at. Right. If you go to the Green Radio website or you look at the Green Radio documentation, it's clearly written for engineers. Mm -hmm. Everything we produce is written for engineers. We don't, we don't have a marketing team. Right. So how you're saying we need to convince managers to that Green Radio open source is the answer. Like how do we need a marketing team? So I don't know about that, but what I will say, what I, what I, what I will say about not necessarily a marketing team, but, but a conference like this that happened this week, and the conversations I've had with folks who came here and, and, and are walking away with a lot more understanding, not only of GNU Radio, but of what it's accomplished and what it's able to do. This idea that we've seen in multiple uh, uh, presentations so far this week of, here is a basic theory to, I've, I've implemented it and I'm actually pro, you know, using it on, on real signals that we've seen at least in multiple, like people are walking away sometimes stunned and astounded by that's the level of conversation and education that they're getting from here and they're going to take that back to their management and say because you send me here I am now a better employee and that's I think going to show up in the records. Uh, okay. of their Ken what about your perspective? Well first of all I, I want to attack the moderator and the question itself are, are you applying? <laughs> Please do. Uh, yeah I am. The, uh, are you implying that this this phenomena of, of less out or let me rephrase it that industry is picking up open source faster than the federal government? Is this problem unique to the federal government? No, I don't think it's unique, but I think that it's more opaque. And it's harder, I, it's, from my perspective, having run this project for almost two years now, mm -hmm. uh, it is more difficult for us to, when we, so a large part of what I do, for example, is just education. Not about GNU Radio, but just about open source in general. Sure. And it's not uncommon for uh, me to sit down with people and just say, this is what open source is, this is what GNU Radio is, this is why it's good, right? And it's much easier for that to happen in the commercial world, in my experience, than for these, you know, people who are locked in holes in various government agencies <laughs> to come out and find us. Like, I, I can't get in touch with them, and they don't get in touch with us. It's just, it's largely a more opaque organization. All right, I'll, I'll accept that. Uh, government tends to travel less. They're not out interacting maybe as much as they could or should. But it seems like the premise of your question then is what can the open source community do to help break that? Down? Exactly, that, that was my question, is what, yeah. what is it that we can be doing to break down that wall? Like how, if people come to us and like, hey, educate us about open source and good radio, we're happy to do it. Yeah. But how do we tell them that they need to come to us? <laughs> um, I wish I had an answer to that, but I, I think you know, marketing and outreach, maybe something on the website. Just I, I think just keep carrying on the fight and in, in, uh, in the sense of just knocking on the door and trying to make it known. Tom, we only have a minute left, so you're going to close it. Yeah. Uh, 
Tom told a story about how uh, with FreeBSD, here came some money from DARPA, and that it was immediately suspected. And I mean, there's, there's in that community, there was very little trust that that was good, and there was this suspicion of nefarious activity. Um, there, there is this sense, I don't know if trust is the right word, but there's a lot of distrust, uh, I think, that um, perhaps the public has for the government. Perhaps the government has earned that reputation, perhaps not. Uh, but the one thing I would ask of the open source community is keep an open mind, because there are people who are trying to fight the good fight. And so, you know, continue to do those engagements, and yeah, every time now and then you might be disappointed, but there are, it's a large organization, and there's plenty of people and plenty of groups that do want to engage and do want to kind of increase the value of this community. Just keep an open mind is all I ask. All right, and with that, we're going to close. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, that's the end of today. It's also the end of the uh, technical conference. We have no tech talks tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow's schedule is kind of interesting. The first half of the day, the ham radio exam is happening. Uh, Paul Tillman's DARPA workshop is happening. And we have lightning talks. So the lightning talks will be in here, uh, in the general, in the ballroom. The ham radio exam and the DARPA workshop are actually on the boat, the one that we were on a couple nights ago. So the first floor is the DARPA workshop. The second floor is the ham radio exam. Uh, all of these things start at 8.30. So it doesn't really make sense for everyone to come to the ballroom and then everyone to have to make their way down to the marina who's participating. So we will not meet here for a general conference opening in the morning. Uh, if you're here at 8.30, we're going to start the lightning talks. Uh, if you're participating, participating in the ham radio exam or the DARPA workshop, head to the boat. Uh, we then have lunch at the usual time. Uh, lunch tomorrow is at that pond, uh, not the one with the seals, the pond, the same pond that we had lunch at uh, on Monday. And then in the afternoon, uh, this room is going to get split. So a portion of it will be walled off. The Edis Research uh, final tutorial session is going to be in one part of the room. The rest of the room is going to be the developer summit. So you all should have received an email from me through Eventbrite. Uh, it's a survey for what topic workshops you might be interested in. Uh, the developer summit is, is, we try to make it as free form as possible for people who kind of want to self-organize. Uh, we also try to provide some sort of formal structure uh, for people who are interested in a topic but don't necessarily know who else in the community is interested in it. Um, what's up? Oh, okay, I'll mention that. Um, so please, re please respond to the survey. Uh, topics that get a uh, strong interest, we will try to organize and make sure we have people that are, that are there to talk about those things. Uh, and a reminder for the ham radio exam, you need a picture ID to take it. So if you're going to the ham radio exam, remember your picture ID. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh.